right, good afternoon everyone. I'm Liz Stahl, Extension Educator with the University of Minnesota Extension, and I'd like to welcome you today to our webinar series, uh, Central Row Crop Management for Summer 2020. Uh, and again, thanks for joining us today. And just a reminder, this is a collaborative effort between our colleagues at Iowa State University Extension and Outreach and University of Minnesota Extension. And of course, I'd like to thank Megan Anderson and Angie, Angie Eric Hintz at Iowa State who've worked with Phyllis Bongard, Lisa Benkin and myself in pulling this webinar series together. Uh, just a few housekeeping things. If you have any questions, please enter those in the Q&A box. Uh, you can enter those questions at any time. Uh, we will answer those when Ken is done speaking today. Um, and then note if you have any technical issues, please just enter those in the chat box. Uh, so again, if you have questions, please put those in the Q&A box. Uh, we will have recordings of all these sessions available at the U of M Extension website. That link is in the chat box. Uh, we also have a Cybox account at Iowa State uh, that is posted as well. And that also has links about um, how you can self-report CEUs. Um, I'd also like to thank our sponsor for today's program, which is the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. Um, so again, uh, we'll have the speaker about 20 minute presentation, then we'll open it up for questions. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. It's Dr. Ken Osley, uh, University of Minnesota Extension Entomologist, and will be covering the latest on corn rootworm management. So Ken, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen, and we will go ahead with your presentation. Well, good afternoon. I'm glad to be with you on this Quit raining up here, so uh, it's a chance to think about uh, what's been happening with uh, corn rootworm. So this today I'm going to be covering a variety of topics. Uh, we're going to just briefly introduce some aspects of rootworm life cycle and dynamic that are going to be that will help explain what's going on as we discuss uh, um, management options. Uh, we'll cover the options in a general way talk about the resistance that corn rootworms have developed to each of the options, and then finally update you with some recent data on BT transgenic performance and the status of resistance, the changing role of insecticides and in crop rotation, and then finally talk about how we might put all this together in terms of scouting for rootworm issues and diagnosing uh, what's going on in our fields. So with that, let's get started now talking about the corn rootworm. Obviously, we're concerned about what impacts corn rootworm has on corn. Um, the eggs that were overwintering ha hatched uh, about five weeks ago, uh, roughly now, so we're getting adult emergence underway. And during that larval period, they feed on the root tissue, causing injury that leads to uh, inability to pull up water and nutrients like plants normally would. It affects standability of the plants. Um, and even the lodging can disrupt pollination. Then finally, as adults emerge, we see them feeding on silks as a preferred food source. They will also feed on leaf tissue. Um, and then finally, in extreme cases, if there's enough silk feeding, you get impacts on pollination and kernel set. And uh, overall, then you have these combined effects of diseases entering in the root system, uh, the impacts on photosynthesis and nutrient uptake and water balance in the plant. In those areas right now that have some moisture stress out there, you can even see the impacts that are occurring on growth. Um, and finally, we end up with the yield impacts and of course the ongoing concern when you've got higher levels of damage is harvestability issues. So, there's a wide array of things that will cause concern among growers and anybody who's encountered a situation like this uh, knows they need to change something to deal with with management it's not always as dramatic as this um, so before we really get started talking about reward management it's good to take 
a moment to just ponder what risks we're actually trying to manage. And the only reason I bring this up is that the different management tactics will vary in their impacts and the benefits you're likely to uh, see. So it's important to be aware of what to expect out of these different management tactics. Obviously, we're probably concerned about yield loss, but more importantly, along with that, there's concern about harvestability of the crop. Uh, lodging by itself will disrupt light interception and actually rob yield more than you might believe from just the redu reduction in nutrient and water uptake. Obviously, we could manage root injury and go for that. Um, there are some tactics that are more root protection oriented, other tactics that are actually aimed at generating kills. So you may be concerned about managing rootworm numbers overall and keeping the numbers low. And then finally, I think all of us would like to, to ensure that we're getting a good economic return on our investment in rootworm management. So that's the risk side. Well, let's talk about the tactics that are available to us. And each of these has benefits and um, limitations. Uh, crop rotation is the one that Midwestern growers have primarily relied on over the years. But uh, with the advent of soil insecticides, gave the opportunity to grow more corn on corn. And then lately those insecticides have been replaced in part with transgenic traits. Um, so we've gotten away from crop rotation. There's been a little bit of a pendulum swing in the last few years as we went totally towards um, extensive reliance on uh, BT traits, uh, but with the development of resistance to the BT traits, obviously, crop rotation is looking like a better option in some cases. Seed treatments, of course, have been a standby for protecting corn from soil and seed feeding insects. Uh, but there's a limitation when it comes to corn rootworms, namely that it's hard to get a high enough rate to get of effective control. Soil insecticides um, will do can do a decent job, but we're only treating a limited part of the soil profile. So we only typically get in the range of 50 to 60% control uh, with soil insecticides. That's a far cry from BT traits, where we've actually looking at uh, efficacy against a susceptible population in the range of greater than 95% control with some of the pyramids we're looking at 98, 99% control. And finally, in some parts of the Great Plains, especially, there's been a focus on adult sprays to control pollination issues, um, but in particular to uh, eliminate egg laying so that we don't have to deal with the population uh, following. Um, the irony is that corn rootworms are extremely adaptable and they have developed resistance to all of the options that you see on this list. And BT traits are just the most recent example. It's kind of humbling to think that uh, resistance to BT traits appeared after only about six to eight years of trait use. Um, so they developed resistance very quickly and, and much quicker than expected. But overall, we take an IPM approach where we want to use what tactics make sense to put together so that we're addressing the risk um, that the insects pose and actually trying to match that risk with management options. And that will necessitate getting some intelligence on the field and the population that's in it. And so scouting is extremely important if we want to keep on top of what's happening in the field. Um, rootworm populations can be extremely dynamic um, and scouting gives you a heads up on changes that are taking place and what's working and not working. 
So let's talk about some of these in just in a real general sense. Um, you can read through this slide kind of at your leisure, but basically you know, for the last, since traits were introduced, we've had a real roller coaster ride in terms of BT performance and the development of resistance. It dawned in 2009 in some parts of the Midwest um, in Western corn rootworm. Uh, and it took several years before we saw it in northern corn rootworms. The resistance has been verified to all proteins. The, uh, primarily, the CRY3 proteins are taking, have taken the brunt uh, because of cross resistance among the CRY3s. And the irony, of course, is that uh, while well, resistance was first noted to CRY3BU1, um, we've had resistance also documented to modified CRY3A and ECRY 3.1, which is present in Duracade and really hasn't made it to the marketplace in a big way yet. So um, having said that the focus is mainly on the CRY 3s, uh, the other fourth trait here is CRY 34-35. And we're also seeing resistance appearing to CRY3435, both as an individual uh, trait and in pyramids with other traits. Um, over the last five years or so, reports on uh, peaked in probably 2013, um, and we've seen Corn rootworm populations and reports of performance problems generally decline in the Midwest. Uh, this has been attributed to weather, the increased use of BT pyramids, more crop rotation, and added soil insecticide use. But it's important to remember that even though numbers appear lower in some areas, uh, the resistance genes have not disappeared. They're still there. Um, they're waiting for conditions to become more favorable for corn rootworms in terms of weather. We may be seeing that this year where we had a mild winter, so we didn't get a lot of winter egg mortality. We, had, uh, we didn't have excessive moisture this spring, so we got extremely good establishment on corn. So populations in many parts of the mid in Minnesota and probably northern Iowa are looking fairly good at this point. Well, let's take a look at some of the performance, recent performance data just to illustrate what's going on. Um, you'll see on the next few slides some various uh, trait packages on the bottom. Against a susceptible population, this is the kind of performance we normally see. The white bars here are the Don-BT hybrids and the other bars indicate various BT uh, tr individual traits or trait combinations. And you can see we're ranging all the way from in generally 93 to 100% reduction in injury. So again, susceptible population, the traits are quite impressive. Um, when we take a look at a field where selection pressure has been taking place and we're starting to see some lodging show up, here we start to see uh, the cross resistance. So for example, if you compare BT3P, the blue, light blue bar there, with its corresponding white check or unprotected hybrid, you can see we're actually producing, we have 10% more damage um, in the VT triple than we do in the unprotected. And then if we look across at uh, 3111, <coughs> excuse me, and 5222, we see that we're not getting good control either. And that's where the cross resistance I'm referring to comes in. At this particular site, uh, if you take a look at uh, AMX, AMXT, and SparkStacks, um, you see that they're all performing fairly well. Um, so 
the cry 34, 35 is coming through um, on, at this location. So if that were the only deal issue we were dealing with, just planting a trait or planting a hybrid of the cry 34, 35 would do the trick. <coughs> um, now, we had another site brought to our attention uh, a couple years ago, and this was one that uh, the selection pressure was via smart stacks. So with smart stacks, you have two proteins present in the field, and the grower had been using smart stacks since they were commercially available. And uh, what we found in that field is that we saw the VT triple issue again with one of the proteins not performing well. The other protein, uh, which is indicated by the dark blue bar here, the AMX wasn't performing well either, as was the stack, <coughs> uh, as were several stacks. The 3111 and the 5222 were not performing well either. So as we look across this uh, spectrum of products, only the insecticide seems to be working well. Um, and just for a frame of reference, EPA asks growers and the companies to report any fields that have more than five roots pruned. Um, and you can see in this case that we would be basically reporting everything. Looks like we're getting a little benefit uh, on the smart stacks. But the surprise at Litchfield, instead of the normal Western corn rootworm population, we expect that this population had uh, Northern corn rootworms. And if you, <clears throat> the thing in any of these fields that are developing resistance is that they are producing tremendous amounts of beetles and those beetles are available to spread the resistance genes locally and in the case of Western corn rootworms, you can actually get long distance dispersal and the spreading of those resistant genes as well. This looks at beetle emergence and what kind of reduction in beetle emergence we're getting. And basically you can see here going from left to right, the VT triple and the smart stacks have minimal impacts. Um, we see a little more impact with the AMX and the AMXT and very little impact again with the 3111 and the 5222. Um, so it's, it's astounding to think that even though these hybrids, for example, SmartStack, you know, had about six roots pruned and yet it's producing, it's only, it's producing 10% more beetles than the unprotected corn. Well, um, against this backdrop of resistance developing with Westerns, one of the concerns we've had is that uh, populations are shifting in composition. Uh, Northern corn rootworm populations were extremely low for quite a while you know, in the upper Midwest. This is some data from Wisconsin. And look at what's happening from 2014 to now compared to previous years. And you can see that the Northern to Western ratio has jumped and has changed significantly from what it previously was. So more Northerns are being produced out there. And the unsettling thought is that is the question, is this increase due to uh, resistance developing in Northerns? Um, just a reminder, with both species, we've got uh, resistance to crop rotation with uh, corn, Western corn rootworm, uh, we've got a shift in egg laying behavior in the soybean variant. Um, and that soybean variant has resistance just like other, you know, Western corn rootworms that aren't resistant to crop rotation. But uh, in northern corn rootworm, we have extended diapause where eggs actually persist in the soil two, three, or four years before hatching. And that can allow them to get around crop rotation. So here's a slide from 2007 showing the impacts of extended diapause. 
um, in a particular field. The question is, are these northern cornworms that are developing resistance, are they populations with extended diapause? And whether it's the soybean variant or extended diapause in northerns, what the, that biotype, what those biotypes can do is extend the resistant issues from corn on corn to rotated uh, corn. On the transgenic front, there's uh, some new traits being developed by most of the companies, one closest to registration is Smart Stacks Pro. It's awaiting export approval for Europe. I thought I'd show you just some quick data. Um, if you look at the bar graph on the right, um, this is what the, what the performance looks like against northern corn rootworm at the Litchfield site. You see similar patterns with western corn rootworm. If SmartStax is performing well, of course, SmartStax Pro with the added uh, RNAi trait it performs very well. Um, if SmartStax is not working as well, which is the case at the Litchfield sites, it looks like SmartStax Pro is a management, uh, off, offers a management solution for some of these challenging resistance sites where we're still getting excellent uh, control. So um, that's a beneficial um, attribute of having a totally different kind of trait involved in root protection. Um, and it extends not only to beetle numbers, but also to rips pruned. And you can see here, smart stacks is only giving us about 40% control, and whereas we're getting 97% with the smart stacks pro. Um, the other options we've talked about have been soil insecticides. Um, they can do a good job. Um, and in dry weather conditions, they may not work so well. So we see a little bit of variability in performance. In 2019, we had extremely wet conditions. And what's interesting is that the, um, the liquids were performed exceedingly well under that moisture environment. Um, you'll notice two columns on the right for Ampex. Ampex is a liquid neonic form formulation. Um, the idea being that it's, if, if it's applied in furrow as a liquid, it doesn't have the application issues and the spread to pollinators that we've seen with the dust coming off the um, seed treatment formulations. Um, but no matter what tactics we're contemplating for our field, if we don't want know what's happening in the field, we're operating blind. And the only way to really get a handle on things is get, there are only two pieces of data that could help you interpret. One is to get a handle on the corn rootworm population itself, either by doing visual counts like the woman in this slide is doing, or by putting up sticky traps and looking at what kind of numbers uh, we are getting in the field. One of the things we've seen is that beetle numbers are probably the quickest sign that something's going awry in a field because the corn can still stand, it may still yield well, but it can be producing tremendous amounts of beetles. Um, so that's why it's important to take a look at that. The other attribute we could look at is root injury like you see in the lower right corner of this slide. That would also give us an idea how things are going in terms of root protection. There's a couple slides here that just summarize management. And um, one for corn on corn and one for corn after soybeans. And as we get into the uh, question answer period here, I invite you to take a look at this and then briefly we can put up the uh, rotated corn uh, management suggestions. So we've got a couple of options there. I would like Minnesota 
participants to note that we have sticky traps available for monitoring fields. They are sponsored by the Minnesota Corn Research and Promotion Council. If you would like to get a hold of some kits and put them in play in fields of interest for you, I put the email address here. Just send us a note on how many fields you'd like to monitor and the contact info is uh, to the address. Well, with that, uh, Liz, I'll turn it back over to you. All right. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Um, yeah, I do have a couple questions that popped up here. Um, one question I think that's real interesting for now, um, you know, is there anything alarming that's showing up here in 2020 to you? Well, one of the things that is really coming home is that uh, we're getting a significant number of reports from um, West Central Minnesota, um, including adjacent areas in North and South Dakota, uh, where smart stacks are having uh, much more, many more performance problem issues than we've seen in the past. Um, so that's kind of just a reinforcement and idea that this selection pressure is ongoing and it's going to get worse unless we deal with this population in part. Okay, thank you. Uh, and here's another question. One was, and I also had a request if you want, wouldn't mind sharing that management slide uh, again too, if you could just leave that up. Um, people wanted to look at that again a little more closely but uh, here's another question you know should farmers be concerned about paying for for a trait that may not be performing as advertised so here's the corn on corn um, but uh, could you repeat the question um, yeah it was a question about you know what what do you think about a farmer you know paying for traits that may not be performing as advertised well Corn rootworm populations are variable from field to field. So in terms of pressure, in terms of the degree of resistance development in the field, but keep in mind that fields are also sharing beetles. So um, even if you were managing things incredibly well, uh, you can still end up with resistant beetles in your field courtesy of uh, your neighbors or in western corn rootworms, it's been noted that uh, you can get dispersal up to 67 miles. So, you know, these populations do move. Northern corn rootworms are more homebodies, so I would generally look in the range of two to five miles. Uh, but um, having said that, we're at a point in time when growers may not know what they're really facing in their fields. Um, and so, you know, that the question was about traits. You can, you can go into fields where the traits will work perfectly well and two miles down the road, the trait fails. So, <clears throat> the only way you can really get a handle on that for making decisions uh, for next year or years following is either looking at injury to the roots. Um, if you need some help with that, get an ag professional in if you don't know how to do it yourself. Um, or to take a look at beetle numbers. Because as I mentioned, beetle numbers will tip you off right away to whether the trait's not giving the level of control you'd expect. Okay. Uh, so, you know, certainly growers are paying extra for the traits. Um, it would be reasonable to expect performance of traits, uh, but basically, I think from a company standpoint, they just lift up their hands and say, we don't know what situation the growers putting these traits in. So. Okay, we had a few more questions pop in. I know we're at 1.30, but if, uh, if you don't mind, we'll hang on a few more minutes here. Um, again, because the number of questions have rolled in here. Uh, here is a question about um, resistance to smart 
smart stacks, you know, impacting Duracade. Um, can you explain that again? So is resistance to smart, smart stacks, does that impact Duracade, but Duracade resistance may not impact smart stacks? Can you just explain that relationship again? Well, it goes back to the traits that are in smart stacks versus the traits that are in, in Duracade. So, with, and let's throw a little historical dimension to it. Resistance first developed to <clears throat> VT triple, the CRI3 BD1 trait that's in VT triple. <clears throat> um, when we went into fields with transgenic comparison studies where we put in all the trait and trait packages to look at how they performed against these resistant populations, <clears throat> we discovered that there was cross resistance to other CRY3s. And so the other two CRY3s are uh, modified CRY3A that you would find in, you know, the Syngenta 3111 uh, Northrop King 3111 trades, for example, hybrids. Um, <clears throat> and the other CRY3 is eCRY 3.1. And in Duracade, you find both of those present as a stack or a pyramid. Um, so you have smart stacks, which is a pyramid of CRI 3 BB1 plus CRI 3435. And remember that CRI 3435 is a, is a different protein. It's not affected by the cross resistance in the same way that we saw earlier. So in fields that had VT triple problems, we would frequently find that smart stacks would work well. Uh, but 3111 and, uh, for example, uh, the Agersher rootworm trade or the uh, Duracade might not work well in that field. Uh, but as selection pressure went on, we started to see uh, problems surfacing uh, with CRY 3435. So think of it this way, if you've got a resistant population, the uh, to VT triple, and you're using smart stacks. The only part of that that's really working well was the CRY 3435. And after several years of CRY 3435, you're selecting for resistance to the CRY 3435. And eventually, you'd expect the the smart stack pyramid to show problems as well. Huh. Um, so that's how you can get problems with both Duracade and smart stacks. And, okay. And so smart stacks, um, sorry, Duracade, even though it's not been on the market anywhere near as long, in fact, this <coughs> is a unfortunate victim of this cross resistance with CRY3. Huh. Okay, and this kind of ties with this too. We had a question here. Um, you know, if you have issues with traded corn plus, you know, wide drop lures ban or similar treatments as recommended by the seed companies, what other options does a person have, you know? Well, so if I'm looking at a severe resistance situation, there are really two things one going on. One is I've got heavy corn rootworm pressure. So somehow I need to reduce that corn rootworm pressure. And the other one is that the beetles that are causing the injury are resistant. Um, so if you continue with the same traits or if you switch to a pyramid with that same trait, um, you can have performance issues on um, right off the bat, or they may take a while to develop, but either way, you're still dealing with heavy pressure. And one of the things that we've seen is um, even traits that are working well um, can have problems in heavy pressure situations. Um, so, I'd be thinking about how can I reduce the pressure? Um, and there are really only 
three ways to do it. One is switch to a totally different transgenic trait, you know, that the population hasn't seen. Rotate the field and keeping in mind that we've got some rotational resistance in both westerns and northerns out there, so that may not be an option for particular growers depending on where they are. And the third option would be um, spray the adults to get kill. Um, soil insecticides only give, you know, typically somewhere in the range of 40 to 70 percent control. And so under heavy pressure, you can see enough rootworms survive to cause significant injury. Um, so growers have limitations out there on what they can do. Um, they may need that corn on corn. Um, they may not have ground suitable for growing an alternative crop like soybean. Um, so there may be constraints to what they can do, but the best options hands down are to, to rotate, pull in a di different trait, or use a adult control to eliminate egg laying. I was looking at there. Thanks, Ken. And all right, we'll sneak in one last question here. Can you explain, and this is probably not going to be a short answer here, but just curious about explaining the difference between the survival of rootworms from the BT traits compared to the RNAi technology. If you have any thoughts on that. Okay, say that question again. Uh, it says, can you explain the difference between the survival of rootworms from the BT traits compared to the RNA I technology? Well, the, what the RNA I technology does is, <clears throat> without getting too deep into the mechanism, is uh, diminishes a critical protein production in the beetles. Um, it requires prolonged exposure, uh, ingestion of root tissue. Uh, because <clears throat> you've got, it's an attrition process. You've got to get enough reduction of those critical proteins that it starts to affect the, the growth and function of the insect. Um, in BT, you're dealing with disruption of the gut lining, and uh, some beetles survive it, others don't. So <clears throat> the two modes of action are independent of each other, um, but the companies uh, know that uh, you get resistance development to the RNAi um, as well as to the BT. And so if you want to lengthen out the perspective period of commercial viability, then you couple the RNAi with the BTs. And so that's why in SmartStacks Pro, you just have the RNAi added to the two BT proteins that are already in SmartStacks. All right. Thank you, Ken, for that description. But uh, OK, well, I'm looking at the time here. So I think we're going to wrap things up. And again, if we have uh, any other questions, I'm sure Ken will be happy to uh, address those. Uh, and so again, thanks everybody for attending today. And uh, again, check that Cybox account if you do want to uh, self-report for CEUs. And remind you to uh, join us again on Thursday, the 23rd. Uh, we'll have Soybean Gal Midge will be the focus of that presentation. So, and we'll have a recording of this available on our Extension website as well too. And again, thanks to the Minnesota Corn Growers for helping uh, sponsor this program. And thank you, Ken, for uh, joining us today. So. Thanks, everyone, and have a great rest of the week. I enjoyed it. Have a good time out there.